Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple, that is, who are of royalty, embrace ash heaps. Verse 6, for the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones, and it has become as dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. Verse 10, the hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They have become their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled the fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. As you read these first 11 verses, what you see is it used to be this way and now it's this way, right? There's this instant reversal because of the damage done by sin. And, and so Jeremiah laments the fact, oh, it, it, it Children and moms and dads and families used to be like this. Now it's like this. Oh, the, the royalty used to feast on delicacies and have hors d'oeuvres, and, and now they're dumpster diving. And, and so he shows this instant reversal of how when we have a cause for lament and we don't lament before it's too late, we often find ourselves in lamentations. Chapter 4, look at verses 1 and 2. He talks about gold. Gold is supposed to be an untarnishable product. So the untarnishable city of Jerusalem has now been tarnished. Uh, he gives reference to clay pots that now the people of Jerusalem are like broken pottery. I thought verses 3 to 5 was really interesting in the text. You know, he, he talks about ostriches. I said in the first service, of all the animals to, to highlight during this time, in, in this super sad time in Jerusalem's history, he says uh, parents during this were like ostriches. You know, it's interesting. There's actually a whole passage about ostriches in the Bible. You're like, prove it. Well, I'll prove it to you. It says this in Job 39, 13 through 16. The ostrich leaves her eggs to the earth, lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young as if they were not hers. I'm not an ostrich expert, so don't go away thinking that I have my doctorate in ostrich studies. I've only read Job 39. <laughs> but it's a, apparently the ostrich mom will lay the egg, kick some dirt up on it, and just go away and let her child figure it out. Now that would seem cruel and unusual if a human mom or dad had a baby and then shortly after its birth, say, kick some dirt on the baby and say, good luck with life, son. Good luck. You know, you get DCFS called on you if you do that, right? You know, that's not a good thing. And so what's interesting is all this is playing out. And here's really the first ca common cause for lament, if you're taking notes, is misplaced trust. All this is happening in Lamentations chapter 4, as I'm going to elaborate here in a second, is because their trust was in the wrong people and the wrong things, not namely in God. All throughout the Old Testament, God just says emphatically, time after time after time, if you will obey me, if you will follow my commandments, I will take care of your every need. You will never have to go through a time of lamenting in the book of Lamentations. If you would just hang with me and live for me. So uh, on the note of ostriches, uh, the, you know, a cruel ostrich mom just leaves her kid to get trampled on. There's also an interesting uh, animal called the quokka. Quokka. Can you say quokka with me? Beth really liked this first service. Right? Say quokka. Quokka. Quokka is this kind of animal. You ever, you ever felt like a bad parent before? And all the parents raise their hands, right? Like we, we really try our best each day to say, I'm going to really get it right this time. <laughs> and if you're feeling like a bad parent this morning, Quokkas toss their babies at predators so that they can escape. <laughs> that literally when, when threatened by a predator, they will drop their young, their little Joey, because they're part of the wallaby family. So they're like a miniature kangaroo version of an animal. And they'll drop their baby so the, the baby will make noise and be a distraction to the predators. They can run off. And every mom and dad said, I've been there, I've been there you know. Yeah. So whether you're an ostrich or a quokka, you know, whatever you are, that's the point of this passage is look how crazy it is. You know, it's, it, it's, it's hard to believe that ostriches and quokkas are hardwired to do that. But the point here is way more of a saddening note that this is happening not with Quokas, not with ostriches, but with who? 
human moms, human dads, that the children are suffering because of all of this unrepentant sin and this misplaced trust. You see this at the very beginning of the book of Lamentations, if you flip back a page or two to Lamentations chapter one, the second verse. It doesn't take long for Jeremiah to get into this dirge, this funeral song of Lamentations, and he says this in Lamentations 1, 2. She, the city of Jerusalem, weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks among all her lovers, that is her foreign allies that she trusted in. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Coming back to our text in chapter 4, it says in verse 6 that Jerusalem's destruction is slow. It's like a crock pot, not like a microwave. Verse 6 gives the example. Remember how Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire instantly at a moment's notice? He said, man, better that than this. He even says similarly the same thing in verse 9. Uh, he says, uh, oh, let me get on the right page here. Verse 9, happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger. You know, rather die by the sword than die from starvation. And so Jeremiah laments, all, and he gives all these different examples of all these different things that are going on. Verse 5, the princes who were eating hors d'oeuvres and feasting on filet mignon every day, now they're dumpster diving for bagels in the dumpster. You know, just everything was one thing, and now it's this other terrible thing, Jeremiah says. A question I want you to, to ask about this, and this all happened because of misplaced trust. And so something I want you to think through applicably for this first point is where have I been burned with misplaced trust? What's something, someone, some achievement, something that I finally got that I thought would be the game changer in my life? It turned out to not hold up to its advertisement. Maybe a friend I confided in thought it was trustworthy, proved to be untrustworthy. We've all been burned by misplaced trust to our regret. And Lamentations 4 mourns that fact indeed of this common cause for lament being misplaced trust. Lamenting misplaced trust in our own personal life, it reorients our heart for what king and kingdom we're after. That's why I brought you back to chapter 1 verse 2. Because God's own people were putting their trust in Egypt, other nations, other things, namely not God. And they were suffering incredibly for it because of their misplaced trust. Read with me the second part of our text this morning, chapter 4, verses 12 to 20. Jeremiah goes on to lament. He says, the kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. What he's saying there in verse 12 is saying, Jerusalem was this impregnable city. It was unconquerable. No one could hold it up. That's because God always had it under his wing. You know, no one could ever take it over if God was on her side. And now that God has withdrawn and been actively against Jerusalem for this time of discipline and chastisement, now the whole world is in awe, like, wow, look at Jerusalem in ruins because of this. And then verse 13, Jeremiah puts all of this on two groups of people. He says in verse 13, this was for the sins of of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away, unclean, people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers, people said among the nations. They shall stay with us no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Verse 17, our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we waited for a nation which could not save. There's that misplaced trust again. Verse 18, they dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were numbered for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. And finally, the breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the nations. This second cause for lament is this, misguided voices. 
verse 13 to 16 is, is what you need to know on this point. Jeremiah puts it and pins it on the priests and the prophets, namely the prophets that were false. Jeremiah himself was a prophet, right? A true prophet that spoke from the Lord, the Lord's word. But many people were citing false hope and giving sermons and messages from, quote, the Lord that they thought the people wanted to hear, maybe that they wanted to hear themselves. False prophets are the same as today as they are yesterday and in Jeremiah's day and for all time. Is that simply that they don't proclaim God's word faithfully? They give, quote, a false word from the Lord. And so what happens is for 40 years during Jeremiah, as he was trying to be a true faithful prophet, he was battling all these opposing voices. So, for instance, let me, let's just walk through one of these examples in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes right before Lamentations. Jeremiah writes the book of Lamentations. And so, speaking from personal experience on misguided voices and trying to battle against that, we read in Jeremiah 26, 8, when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people. Stop and just look at that first part of the verse. What has Jeremiah done? He's spoken everything the Lord wanted him to say. He hasn't held anything back. You know, sometimes it's really hard for us to hear negative stuff. We would call it negative. Uh, Maybe another synonym would be hard. Hard, challenging things, things that are not fun to hear. Does that negate the truthfulness of those things? No. Just makes it hard to take. Steve Lawson famously said, the Bible is not hard to understand. It's hard to swallow. Isn't that the truth? Thinking about these misguided voices that Jeremiah battled, it says that he finished speaking all that the Lord, he said it all. He didn't hold anything back. He was uncensored with the message from the Lord. And he said it to how many people? All of them. Then the priests and the prophets, look what it says in Lamentations 4.13. That's why he pins it on them. He says it's because they have constantly pointed people God's people away from the right direction. Then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of Jeremiah saying, you shall die. Oftentimes when a voice comes into our life and and gets our ears attention, we say, "Ah, man, that's a hard saying. I don't like it. It kind of has some negative ramifications for my life. So I'm going to cut it out. And oftentimes Satan has so deluded us that the only voices that we need to have in our inner circle in our life are people that are positive, people that agree with everything we do. And I'm here to tell you today, that is a false voice. (laughs) Even the Supreme Court would testify that it's important to have dissenting opinions, whether that's the agreeable thing or not. The the reason you need to have disagreeable voices in your life is because it gives you a different perspective. It sharpens you. Even if you don't agree with it, it's still making you think through different filters, different perspectives. So look what happens three verses later with Jeremiah when all the people say, Jeremiah's got to die. He's a false prophet. It says, then the priests and the prophets, they take their turn. The bad voices, they say to the officials and to all the people, this man deserves a sentence of death because he has prophesied against the city as you have heard it with your own ears. They decided and concluded because Jeremiah's, quote, word from the Lord was a hard message to swallow because it was negative, because it was saying that God's holy city, Jerusalem, is going to lay in ruins. They concluded, well, that's got to be a false message from the Lord because no way the Lord would ever do that. And so they say, off with his head. It's no different than Jeremiah's day than our day that people would rather have their ears itched than be in right standing with God. Isn't that the truth? So oftentimes we we like to hear something that doesn't really go against the grain of whatever is going on in our life. Because we're creatures of habit. We like comfortability. And really, I think if we're honest, a lot of times we don't like being challenged on something. And Jeremiah's job was to challenge the people of God with these hard messages from the Lord. And so it even goes on a couple chapters later, a false prophet, a false voice, Hananiah comes on the scene and he says, Hey, this consequence, this chastening period is only going to last for two years. He says, within two years, I'll bring back to this place, everything within two years, just hold on for two years and God's going to make it all right. You know what happened to Hananiah? Because that was not what the Lord said. And that was what his desire was, but he spoke it at, with the Lord's authority. It says at the end of that chapter, therefore thus says the Lord, behold, I will remove you, Hananiah, from the face of the earth. This year you shall die. 
because you have uttered rebellion against the Lord. In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. So they're wanting to off Jeremiah because he's actually speaking the uncensored word of God. And then two chapters later, they see the Lord's judgment on one of these false prophets to say, you guys better listen to Jeremiah. So then Jeremiah comes on the scene, the very next chapter, 29.10, and he says, how many years is it going to be? 70, right? He says, when 70 years are completed, I will visit you and fulfill my promise to you and bring you back to this place. A lot of people's favorite verse is the next verse, Jeremiah 29.11. <laughs> this is a good verse. I can see why a lot of people are, gravitate to Jeremiah 29.11. These are the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you hope and a future, you know, and, and to prosper you. It sounds certainly encouraging. It was certainly a welcomed word from the Lord, you know, considering the, the state of lamentations. But we can't get past this point, right, where Jeremiah didn't just itch people's ears like Hannah and I said and say, oh, you know, in about two months, you know, God will make it right. Oh, in about two years, God will make it right. Oh, you know, let's, uh, let's put our plans on God and tell God what our plans are and he needs to make our plans, his plans, and, and that'll get everything straightened out. Jeremiah just said, no, it's going to be 70 years. So that promise that comes the very next verse came right on the heels of Jeremiah saying, not for 70 years. There's going to be a waiting time and there's going to be a long disciplinary time with this kind of action. Paul said this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. Isn't that the truth? You know, it's, it's not that we always have to have every friend in our circle as a Christian brother or sister, but we ought to be careful of the non-Christian friends that we make tight in our inner circle. Because he's quoting a, a current poet of the day in that verse, Paul is. And so not only was that the cultural norm, uh, it's still a, a truth held up today in the Christian church that we need to really think. So think through this second point of misguided voices. There's a, a two-sided coin on this. Who are voices I need to cut out of my inner circle? Who are people that don't really uh, challenge me in a Christian way, keep me sharp and keep me honest, keep me accountable. And maybe I've cut out people like that. So the opposite side of the coin, who are people that I need to bring back into my circle, in my inner circle, maybe for the first time in my life, we got to get this right. Because when you got bad people in your tribe, in your inner community, in your inner circle, you know, five to seven people or less, your Christian faith will go sideways so fast You'll be lamenting it just like the people in Jerusalem in Lamentations chapter 4 saying, wow, we had all these false voices in our head. We were listening to them for 40 years of our life and look where it landed us. Smoldering ruins of Jerusalem. This happened even with Adam and Eve. This is how sin got started in the first place. God's voice reigned, gave Adam and Eve their direction, gave them literally almost unlimited freedom, gave them one command. Don't eat from that tree. And a false voice, a snake's voice, came in and slithered into their ears and said, Did God really say that? Did, do you really need to do it his way? Why don't you do it your own way? So you can see from the beginning of creation, Satan has been at work with false voices, snake voices, if you will, to, to get us to believe these misguided voices. And we ought to be on guard because we've probably all been burned by Voices that we gave credibility to, someone telling us to do something some way or not do something, and in hindsight, we should have done it or we should have not done it. We need to get that right of who are the voices in my inner circle. Look at verse 20 again with me in the text. Of chapter 4. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the nations. The Lord's anointed in that verse is referring to King Zedekiah. That was the king at the time for Jerusalem. And that what that verse is saying is, man, all our hope was in him. Uh, uh, we were all in on King Zedekiah, that he was going to be our savior. Now, that's never happened in human history, thinking that an earthly political king is going to be our savior, has it? <laughs> Boy, that is an ongoing problem all the time, Right? Jesus, when he was feeding the 5,000, it says they were ready to take him and put him up as a king. And it says he went off into the mountains to escape and to pray. 
And so in, in the same way, Lamentations laments this third cause for lament, and that is this, misbehave leaders. So think about verses 13 to 16 and 20. It's talking about prophets, priests, the king, how all three of these huge office positions in the nation of Israel all failed. The prophet tethered people to the vision of God. The priest facilitated access to the presence of God. The king facilitated military and civil leadership on behalf of God. And historically, all three of these offices worked in unison to serve one another. But now the threefold foundational leadership of Israel is in ruins. I want you to think about how this really applicably applies today. Odds are if you read the internet, read the newspaper, watch news shows, talk to any other Christian person, it is not a surprise that the American church historically has scandals within the church all the time with people in church leadership positions. It's a tragic shame that the bride of Christ should be without spot or wrinkle and it almost seems like at least once a month, some person is making it all wrong, all again. We read about it in the Old Testament, read about it in the New, and experience it in our day-to-day -day reality, and read about it in church history for the last 2,000 years. Misbehaved leaders have been a huge cause for lament in the kingdom of God for far too long. Most recently, the uh, very well-known, world-renowned Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias died within the last year or so from cancer, I believe. And after his, uh, as he was getting really close to death, there were rumors circulating that he was involved in a lot of sexual abuse with many other women. And a lot of people were denying those reports, drawing it up as gossip and whatever else. Well, finally, his, the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries launched a internal investigation in all these claims and it found out that it was pretty much all accurate and that sure enough a guy that had all these brilliant arguments against atheism for Christianity was a sexual abuser for a good part of his life as a married man. Mary DeMuth really put my feelings on that, uh, summed it up in this quote. This is Ravi's tainted legacy, not that he defended God against atheistic arguments, but that he gave those who are far from God a perfect argument to run as far away from him as possible. Isn't that the sad truth? Isn't that a reason to lament today? That so many people will not taste the kingdom of heaven because of people who are representing the kingdom of heaven and living like a pagan does. Maybe even, as Paul says to Timothy, they're actually living worse than an unbeliever. He says in 1 Corinthians 5 about the, the son that's sleeping with his mother-in-law, he says, this type of behavior that is going on in the Christian church, not even the pagans practice that kind of behavior. And the church of God is guilty of it. Misbehaved leaders are always the cause for lament. So look at verse 20 one last time. King Zedekiah is the Lord's anointed. It's not talking about Jesus there in verse 20 when you read the Lord's anointed, the the, the Lord's anointed is referring to King Zedekiah, the current king in Israel. And they're saying all our hope is in him. King Zedekiah is going to lead us to the promised land. He's going to give us this future. He's going he's to do all this. They say, quote, under his shadow, we shall live among the nations. We'll have security. They had misplaced trust in King Zedekiah. They had listened to misguided voices, probably promoting that King Zedekiah is going to be the difference maker from the prophets and priests. And now their leadership has totally crumbled and fallen. If you read Jeremiah 39, you'll read of King Zedekiah's demise. Earlier, Jeremiah had warned King Zedekiah, hey, uh, he says this in Jeremiah 38, 17. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, your life will be spared and this city will not be burned. Well, we got the book of Lamentations. You know, he didn't do that. He didn't have the humility to surrender, to believe this was a word from the Lord. And not only did he, so what happens as you read chapter 39 of Jeremiah, his sons, his children get killed in front of him. Then his eyes get gouged out. That's the last thing he sees. Then he's exiled away into captivity. And if he would have listened to the voice, the righteous voice, Jeremiah in his head, 
saying, this is what you should do. No, 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 we're not going to surrender. In the same way, that's how salvation happens with the gospel, is it starts with surrender. Look at verse 18, the end of it. Jeremiah says, our days were numbered. Our end had come. We're left reading Lamentations 4, stopping there today, was saying, wow, they need a savior. The priests weren't the savior. The prophets weren't the savior. King Zedekiah wasn't the savior. They need a savior. We read this in John 8 to close today, 34 and 36. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Lamentations puts that in words and paints pictures of what that looks like, being a literal slave to sin and a metaphorical slave to sin. Lamentations is the perfect picture of that reality. And Jesus says, this is the case. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free in the, the good news of the gospel is that not just the Jews in Lamentations 4, as their lives were in ruins because of sin, me and you's lives are in ruins because of sinful choices from ourselves, from leadership, from other people around, people who have hurt us, us hurting people, vice versa, all the way around. Sin has corrupted and cursed all of mankind, the Bible says. None are righteous, no, not one. The common cure for all of this is Jesus. Prophet, priest, and king, we're all getting it wrong, but it's good news that Jesus was a prophet. It's good news that he is our all-time high priest, as the book of Hebrews says, that he is not prevented from continuing in office because of death, because he lives forever. It's good news that Jesus is not just some king on a long line of kings, but that he's the king of kings. Amen? Amen. That Jesus is literally this difference maker for us. That Lamentations wasn't just the Jews in 600 B.C., you know, reality, that's our reality as well. These three common causes for lament of misplaced trust, misguided voices, and misbehaved leaders, it points us to Jesus. I'll leave you with this story. I was listening to the radio coming from Effingham to Olney one day. This was like three, four, five years ago. And they were talking about Jesus's ability to save and how it's tied with his lordship. So in other words, a lot of people will read verses like this and raise their hand and say, yeah, I want Jesus to be my savior. That sounds good to me. I'll take Jesus as my savior. But a lot of people push back and are hesitant when we say, well, Jesus first has to be Lord before he's your savior. That means that the word, the Bible is authoritative to your life now that Jesus has in a very literal sense, lordship over your life. It's going to create this Christian lifestyle change, this regeneration in your heart that's going to change your behaviors, your actions, your inactions. And they said the reason that Jesus is qualified to set people free and to be their savior from sin is because he lorded over three things. Sin, death, and Satan. He... In other words, he saved himself from those three because he lorded. So he lords over sin because he was tempted as we are, yet without what? Yet without sin. He lorded over death because he was killed by death, but then rose back from the dead. And so death could not keep him down. And he lorded over Satan by rejecting every temptation that Satan threw at him time and time again. And overcoming Satan himself through his resurrection bodily from the grave. Jesus is qualified to be our savior because he's Lord first. Amen. And so if you don't know him as Lord today, that's where Lamentations 4 points us to. As we all put our trust, our hope, in all these different saviors, all these different things, all these different people. And we all lament the fact of when we have done that and it hasn't been Jesus. Because odds are it has turned out disastrously for your personal life. And so I point you to Jesus today. As you lament the times you've had misplaced trust, as you lament the times you've had misguided voices in your head that you've given credibility to, and as we lament the fact of bad leaders in church history, it all points us to a guy that finally came that fulfilled all three of those offices, that was perfect, that got it right every time, who's the husband of the church, the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. As we lament these bad things in our personal life today, 
let us also celebrate and recognize that Jesus paid it all for us and makes it different so that we can live differently for his kingdom. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Lamentations 4. It is not a fun chapter at all. It's morbid, it's disgusting, it's repulsive, it's all the words. But Lord, man, do we see ourselves in the text this morning where we've all put trust in things we shouldn't have, where we've all banked on things we shouldn't have and people that we shouldn't have, where we've all listened to people we shouldn't. May we cut out these false voices that we need to cut out of our life. And Lord, by your spirit and by the help of other Christian brothers and sisters, may we help analyze what voices we need to bring into our circle. God, I lament the misbehavior of church leaders throughout the ages. I hate it. I despise it. And we know that you are against it. I hate that the church has so many spots and wrinkles time after time because we keep getting it wrong. But Lord, may that reason for lament today also be our reason to be different. To take accountability when we sin personally. To repent humbly when we are in the wrong. And to make it right and to attempt reconciliation as Jesus would have it. So that we can rebound from these lamenting times. And show that the church and the bride is not perfect. But we're being perfected by the blood of the lamb who paid it all. God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus who paid it all and sets us free as sons and daughters and not as slaves to sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with us? Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you be with us throughout this week. Father God, if there be any needs or concerns that uh, somebody may have had on their mind or on their heart that uh, didn't come forward today, please know that we're always here, being in the leadership, to speak with you and help you and talk with you. We just give God all the praise and all the glory. We just hope that your week uh, is blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. You're dismissed. We'll sing you out here. Great is the Lord.